here today to talk to you about crystals, and crystals are something that I hope I'm going to convince uh, you that are everywhere in your world. So crystals uh, are everywhere, and just on this picture here, we have a picture, a picture of some crystals that you would find uh, as a rock sample, possibly. Uh, a sample, uh, this is a Hope Diamond that one would love to, uh, to own. And uh, this is a, a silicon uh, crystal that's been turned into a, a integrated circuits. And it's showing you the beautiful patterns that uh, are put into it when you make it into an integrated circuit. So I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about crystals. Uh, the word crystal comes from uh, the Greek krustalos, which means ice. And it's maybe not surprising that uh, it first was uh, used to describe quartz. So this is a picture of ice. and. This is a picture of quartz. So you can imagine how uh, ancient people might have thought that quartz was some sort of a permanent form of ice. And so uh, having a name ice uh, and work, I, I do a lot of research on crystals. Uh, so it's, uh, someone said, I, what I really need to do is a, is a research study someday on ice, so ice on ice. But uh, anyway, so quartz. <laughs> now. Again, I wanted to convince you that crystals are everywhere in our environment. So uh, we see them in jewelries, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, sapphires. Everybody recognizes those as being crystals. Uh, but we also see them in electronics. The electronic industry, the integrated circuits, are based on silicon and somewhat on germanium and silicon carbide and other uh, uh, single crystals. Uh, also, solar cells, other, other materials are made with uh, crystals. But you also see them in, in uh, food. Salt and sugar are, are crystals. Uh, one, of, one of the places we don't think of them is in uh, biological materials. But it turns out that trees are, have cellulose in them, and something like 20 to 30 percent of cellulose is crystalline. And so, uh, and cellulose is the most uh, abundant material on Earth, a, a natural material on Earth. So uh, we see crystals in, in biological materials. You see it in your own body. Your teeth uh, have a hydroxyapatite in them. And so your teeth have, have crystals in them. You know, and maybe that's why they're so beautiful, right? <laughs> but uh, so uh, they're in your teeth, they're in bones, and of course, Crystals uh, exist in the Earth's crust, the mantle, and the core. And at the very end of the talk, I'm going to tell you about a really cool theory ab about crystals uh, and the, the thinking that there may be a gigantic single crystal at the Earth's core. <clears throat> so, uh, although the word crystal started to refer just to quartz, eventually in the Middle Ages, people started to re refer to any material that had facets on it, see these beautiful facets, as being crystalline. And that is one of the distinguishing properties of crystals, is that they tend to have these facets. And so, what are crystals? Well, I'm going to give you the answer, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story. But the, but the answer is that crystals are materials that are made up of things called unit cells, where the atoms have repeat patterns that fill space. So the key is that it has to be a pattern that can fill space just by displacing this pattern. And it has to fill 3D space, although you can have 2D crystals, and there's something called quasi-crystals that someone was asking me about earlier, which I won't go into, but if you, want, if you later want to talk to me about it, I can tell you a little, a little about quasi-crystals. But you can see some structures, for example this structure, you can't fill 3D space with it. If you took this structure and you try to displace it and, and put it next to it, there's gaps. And so that's a structure that can't form a crystal. Now it turns out if you took two of these, if you reverse this one and put it on top, now you can form a crystal. And in fact, these, these uh, shapes can be very complicated inside. The atoms can be arranged in a very complicated way. So uh, here are th uh, three of the most famous kinds of uh, what we call unit cells that are the building blocks of crystals. So this is a simple cubic unit cell where the atoms are in the corner. And uh, we were just talking yesterday about uh, the elements, and there's only one element that actually uh, it naturally occurs as a simple cubic lattice, and that's polonium. And since polonium is a kind of a rare material, we, we don't see that very often. But uh, body-centered cubic 
and face inner cubic where there are atoms at the corners and at the, the center of the structure or at the faces are very common materials. We see those often in things like aluminum, iron, uh, nickel, uh, most metals tend to be uh, these simple uh, cubic these, uh, excuse me, these, these cubic kind of structures, body-centered or face-centered cubic structures. And then there are only so many kinds of these shapes that can actually uh, make crystals. Uh, there are 14 different kinds, and this just shows a picture of them. I don't think you need to know that for this talk, but just, it is kind of interesting that there are only uh, a certain number of kinds. Now, as, again, as I said, we look at these as being kind of simple, but for every atom in, that's shown in this picture, you can actually have a whole series of atoms that, uh, that uh, are associated with that lattice site. So, now let me just tell you a story. So, you know, I, I told you this, the, the punchline that, that materials, many materials, most materials that you see are made up of crystalline materials. But we didn't know that originally, uh, but people saw all these facets and they wondered, are, is there some internal structure in these materials? And uh, at 19, in 1911, there were two big questions in science. One was, what is the internal structure of materials? Why do they have these facets? Are they made up of these crystals that have these unit cells that repeat? And the other big question was, what's the nature of x-rays? And it turns out that there was one experiment that explained both of those those questions simultaneously. And that was an experiment that was done by Lowy, where he said, well, if materials are made up of these repeat, these repeat unit cells, and if x-rays happen to have a wavelength that's close to, the, to the, the, uh, the distance between the atoms in these materials, then I think if we shine x-rays on them, we'll see a pattern. And indeed, they, sh they took uh, x-rays and they shined them on a material and they saw a pattern. And uh, that was done in 1912 and that solved both problems simultaneously. Suddenly it was clear that x-rays had a wave nature to them and that their wavelength was close to the spacing of atoms in uh, materials and that materials were made up of these repeat cells. And so he won the Nobel Prize in 1914 and Einstein called it the most beautiful experiment that he ever saw. And Einstein, you know, we'd say he's, he's a pretty good judge of good experiments, so. <clears throat> now, although most, uh, uh, although some things are single crystal, most of the things you see are uh, what we call polycrystal. So most materials are made from small crystals rather than one large one. So we call them polycrystal, meaning many small crystals. And so this is a, uh, a electron, I think it's an electron backscattering image of the surface of a sample and it's color coded so that you can see the, the uh, different grains. The, so these, each of these different colored regions is actually a single crystal and they come together and where they come together you know there are lots of defects and those are called grain boundaries. So when material scientists talk about grains, what they're talking about are single crystals that exist within a polycrystalline material and that come together in, in what's called a grain boundary network. And because there are all these little grains that are in a material, they tend to average out the properties. But each of those grains can be quite different. We call it anisotropic. So its properties depend a lot on which direction you turn it. So uh, that in leads to all sorts of interesting effects and we're gonna actually get to play with them a little later in the, uh, when you get to do hands-on stuff. So, uh, this is a picture from some work done by John Budai, who's a friend of mine and a colleague. And so th this is a tomographic image of the crystal structure uh, of a, uh, of a uh, aluminum sample. And it's done in, uh, it's a, so it's a 3D image. And this is using a special tool, a new tool, that allows us for the first time to actually non-destructively look at these grains as they exist in the material. The beauty is that we can now, for the first time, look at these grains, look at each individual grain, look at the grain boundary, and study how it changes as we process it. Whoops. So let me just play that. So now as you, as you see, we're just uh, showing the, the image, and now we'll start cutting down through it. 
and showing the different structures as you go into, into the material. Now it's very interesting, as you saw, as, we, as you passed through one point, there was a flat sheet where the character of the material changed. We don't know why. We don't, it was processed, uh, we don't know exactly how, what the processing conditions were, but this, this, this flat region here is actually hard to, to do. We don't know why it exists that way. When we heated it up and the grains started to grow, they grow along facets in a way that doesn't give you a flat plane. So we really like to understand how we did that. So um, the ability to use x-rays to look at, at things, you heard actually a talk by Ian uh, on uh, using a, uh, you know, uh, the tools like the spallation neutron source to look at, at uh, materials. But that's, that technique, using x-rays to look at things, has become called crystallography. And it's led to an enormous number of Nobel Prizes, 45 Nobel Prizes in crystallography. And the reason is that you can now look at this structure of materials and try to understand how structure affects properties. It gives you very precise information about atomic positions. So let me just give you a couple quick things before we start doing some hands-on activities. The first thing is, the first question we'd ask is why do crystals have facets? So why do they develop these beautiful flat planes that we all recognize as being a crystal? And the reason is that there are certain planes where the atoms are closer together. For example, here, where the atoms are, are nice and close together. The atoms like to be close together. That's what we call close packing. And so, in general, there's a tendency to favor surfaces which, with close packed atoms. That gives you the lowest possible energy. <coughs> So these, this is a, you know, a, a case where you see these beautiful facets on the, on the crystal. And uh, here's some more crystal structures. So here's a face-centered cubic crystal, and you tend to get these nice uh, uh, box-like shapes. And here's a monoclinic crystal where you get more uh, extended shapes with, with uh, facets at different angles. But we don't always see these bulky block-like crystals. Sometimes we see beautiful snowflakes. You know, the, the story that there's no snowflake that's exactly the same. Um, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that, that's what people say. Um, and so you know, we get beautiful uh, dendritic structures. Why do we get dendritic structures sometimes? Well, it depends on the, the conditions under which the growth occurs. So that in some cases, you can get what's called a bump instability. So if you, get a, you have a flat surface that's growing, and you have a tiny little bump on it, then that bump tends to gather atoms more efficiently than the, the broader surface that's around it. And so that bump grows, and that becomes, now uh, the more it grows, the easier it is to grow. But then, oops, there might get a little bump on that surface, and then another, another dendrite grows from that. And so uh, you get the, this, what's called bump instabilities, which exaggerates uh, the bumps and leads to this beautiful dendritic type shape. And so this is actually a picture of, a, of another kind of growth. And it's pretty fast. <clears throat> but that's a, uh, a scanning, uh, uh, um, tunneling microscope image of the growth of a, uh, near a defect. So that actually when you have a defect in materials, that can affect the growth also. So there are all sorts of different things that can affect the growth. So let me just tell you a little bit about some crystals that you see in everyday life. So, uh, metal oxides are a particularly important class of crystals. So, uh, for example, salt is a, is a metal oxide. And, uh, oh, there's, corun there's corundum, that's which you'll be seeing lots of uh, pictures of. That's uh, something that's Al203 is a, is a, uh, is a uh, example of that. Uh, rust, hematite, so this, you see rust everywhere. This is, uh, these are AL203 insulators, uh, corundum insulators. Uh, but the most famous one is water. Uh, you know, we, we're used to liquid water, but we're used to crystalline water also. So that's a metal dioxide. So it has, uh, it's, a, it's a dimetal oxide. So it has hydrogen, two hydrogens, and an oxygen. And uh, it forms a, uh, crystals that we are all very familiar with. And we even see them in space. The uh, rings of Saturn are uh, littered with lots of, of mineral ice. So, we see crystals, we see them in different shapes. 
depending upon the growth conditions, but also their properties can change tremendously depending upon the defects that are in them. So uh, there are different kinds of defects. We can have point defects where we could be missing an atom. We could have an atom in an, that we, that's at a place we normally wouldn't have one. Uh, we can have, uh, and it could be an impurity atom or it could be one of the atoms of the, of the material. Uh, we can have a substitution atom, that's where we have a different kind of atom in a, a site that would normally be uh, uh, occupied by one material. Uh, or we can have correlated defects. And we can have planes of defects. Uh, these are, this is a, what's called a, uh, a plane dislocation. This is a, a line dislocation where you have an uh, a extra plane of atoms that comes in here and it terminates inside the, uh, inside the material. And so uh, there are all sorts of different kinds of defects and these change the properties. It turns out that if it weren't for these kinds of defects, almost all the materials that we that we use would be about 10 times stronger than they are. And so there are some really interesting ideas out there, pretty far out ideas on how we can actually make materials that go way beyond the uh, properties that we're used to dealing with. And the, those typically deal with either getting rid of defects in a very funny kind of way or putting in special kinds of defects. Uh, color is something that comes from uh, typically from uh, these point defects and we'll see some examples of that in some of the uh, crystals that you'll be looking at today. So I just want to give you a, a heads up on some things you can do at home. This is one, I'll give you another one uh, later, but uh, this is an exercise that you could do at home and uh, I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> I, I saw this online, it looks so cool that um, I just haven't had a chance to try it. So I hope it works for you. But it's, it sounds pretty easy. What you need is a, is a refrigerator with a freezer and you need a, uh, an ice cube tray and you need distilled water. So the idea is that if you put distilled water into ice, what will happen is the ice starts to crystallize and it, and it forms a surface layer but it grows from the outside in and so it, there's a hole that's left in the ice. Well, as the ice grows, it expands, which is a very unusual uh, behavior for uh, crystalline materials. But as it expands, it forces water up through this hole and creates a spike. And uh, this does not work if you use normal tap water. Uh, but it does, and that's an interesting question why it doesn't work, and I don't know the answer, but maybe you can figure it out. But, um, but it's, it, it is much more likely to happen if you use distilled water. So this is something you can do at home. It'll be fairly simple. Well, this, this reminds me of a problem I actually worked on. And that is uh, something called whisker growth in tin. So in uh, electronic materials, people are trying to replace lead because lead is toxic. And so tin is a good material to uh, replace lead with, but it has this problem that it can spontaneously grow these whiskers. So, and that's a beautiful single crystal whis whisker that's growing out of this uh, material. It's actually extruded out of, out, of this, out of the material. And these whiskers can grow very long. They can grow so long that they'll short out electronic circuits. And satellites, very expensive satellites put into space, have been lost due to this process. And, and the mechanisms involved are somewhat related to the uh, ice spike. So I think it would be an interesting thing for you to, to try. So um, one of the things I always tell people is that scientists uh, don't just, uh, you know, it isn't just a job. It's, it's something that we, um, that we feel very passionate about. And especially in, in Tennessee, if you believe in something, you don't just talk about it, you sing about it. So um, uh, I'm gonna invite Peggy uh, Bertrand, uh, Professor Bertrand, to come up here, and we're gonna sing you a little song about crystals, and then we'll tell you about the, little, uh, the first activities you're gonna start doing today. This is something that uh, Dr. Ice and I we do is think about science. We want you to sing along. You along to you. Scientists, a lot of scientists are also artists and musicians, so practice for the future. Cell 
muscles begin to form and fight for favored symmetry. They don't want to be alone, they feel compelled to clone, and they call to nearby atoms plaintively. So darling, stand by me in crystal symmetry. Yes, darling, please, please stand, please stand by me. In crystal symmetry, we'll conserve energy. Yes, darling, please, please stand, please stand by me. Now you guys can sing the chorus, right? As crystals start to grow, and fastest start to show, they take on shapes, shapes that we can see. And right sometimes we see from instability, and crystals call to nearby atoms plaintively. Now sing along! Darling, stand by me in crystal symmetry. Yes, darling, please, please stand, please stand by me. In crystal symmetry, we'll conserve energy. Yes, darling, please, please stand, please stand by me. One more time. So darling, stand by me in crystal symmetry. Yes, darling, please, please stand, please stand by me. In crystal symmetry, we'll conserve energy. Yes, darling, please, please stand, please stand by me. <laughs> okay, now, now it's going to be your turn. So we're going to turn you loose on uh, several activities here. Uh, the first one is going to be uh, making some models of crystal, uh, crystal unit cells. And you'll be able to, if you have enough of them, put them together into a model crystal. Uh, the second one is going to be looking at crystals using magnifying glasses and uh, optical loops and you'll be able to uh, actually see crystals in everyday things that you play with and eat. But don't eat it. Don't, <laughs> don't eat it, right. And uh, we'll also have a display of some interesting crystals and we'll be calling you up. I guess Peggy will tell you a little bit more about the details. So. which is one of the most famous gemstones in the world. It's at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, Washington D.C. You can go see it yourself. Um, and uh, here's a picture of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth with, uh, encrusted with uh, lots of different uh, jewels. Uh, here's a picture of the, the Star of Bombay at the Smithsonian. That's a 182-carat 182, uh, 182 star sapphire. Remember I told you sapphire is the same as corundum, an insulating material used for electronics, but it has a little bit of iron and titanium in it. So it's, uh, you know, uh, this is a naturally occurring uh, material, but you can also make it now uh, man-made. And it has a trigonal structure. Um, here is uh, a spinel. Uh, this looks a lot like what we would call ruby. 
So ruby is a, diff a completely different crystal structure, uh, but this looks like ruby. And in fact, this is a picture of uh, the imperial state crown, the black prince ruby. Here's, here's one of the most famous rubies in the world. It actually isn't a ruby. It's a spinel. <laughs> so, but it's uh, the, one of the world's most famous rubies is not a ruby. So, uh, so uh, here's an authentic ruby, and then here's a, a spinel. So you can see that they're very similar in appearance, but uh, in fact, they can be both famous. And this is uh, the Bismarck sapphire. Uh, this, I think, is also, I think, in the Smithsonian. So again, that's, that's an AL203. Uh, here are some emeralds, a uh, hexagonal unit, uh, unit cell, and these are, are of the beryl family. So these are, have a beryllium in them, and the, the, uh, I believe these are uh, iron and titanium also is the, is the impurity, that, uh, the defect that, that uh, makes them have a beautiful color. So, uh, remember we talked about crystal growth and crystal size and shape all depend on the growth conditions and the methods. And so this is a, a picture of, a microscopic picture of ice cream. And uh, you notice that ice cream has uh, air bubbles incorporated in it. It has sugar solution that's, been, that's uh, you know, frozen out. Um, it has various types of crystals, ice crystals. Uh, it's a very complicated structure. And if you've ever made ice cream, you know that if you, uh, if you do it very slowly and uh, don't stir fast enough, you end up with big crystals in it. It's kind of coarse. But if you do it very quickly, then you can get small crystals. So uh, how you grow it makes a difference in uh, the, the sort of texture that it has when you grow it. Now, to talk about a, a, a large crystals, uh, this is an extreme case. This is uh, some, some images from the cave of giant crystals. So here's a guy standing on some crystals. There's this cave in Mexico where these gigantic crystals grow. And it's, uh, yeah, he looks pretty okay there, but it's uh, a very bad uh, environment for most people to stay in. You, they have special tents down there where people go in to, to recover because it's so hot and the, the conditions are so difficult that most people won't last very long in there. Uh, so he's showing off here. He's not in the suits. But this is what people normally do. They wear these special suits. And even with those special suits in there, they can't last very long. Yes? Why is it so warm in there? Well, it's just the conditions under which, it, I mean, it's, it's deep in the earth, so it's a little warmer there, and it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's humid and has just the right conditions to slowly grow these gigantic crystals. And is there a possibility of one day one some of them growing out of the earth? No, I don't think it's, they're ever going to grow out of the earth. <laughs> no. It's, it's just the right conditions there. Okay, so I just want to give you some final words about crystals. And I wanted to remind you, this is the whole message of this uh, presentation. The crystals are everywhere. The crystals are in, in granite, they're in cement, they're in rocks, they're in bones and teeth and polymers and most metals. You just see them in, in everything that you see. There are crystals, and if you look for them, you, you can find them. If you look with a good enough microscope, you'll be able to find them. They're on Mars. The red color of Mars comes from rust. That's uh, hematite that's on the, the surface of Mars. Uh, they cause all sorts of problems. Here's a, a, a water, pipe, or water pipe. This is an oil pipe that has almost been completely occluded by crystals that have grown in the oil pipe. Um, and they're on glass ceramic cooktops, uh, specially designed with different crystals that have different thermal expansion coefficients so that the net thermal expansion coefficient of the glass ceramic is, is very small and that allows you to have these ceramic cooktops. Uh, again, I told you that thermal uh, conductivity and other properties can be uh, anisotropic, that means it's different in different directions for crystals and that will be important in uh, one of the one of the activities we'll do next. Um, and so that can make a difference in the speed of sound. It goes different speeds in different uh, directions in a crystal. It has a difference in the thermal expansion coefficient and, therm and thermal conductivity in many properties. And so here's a, a, a classic example. This is a calcite crystal. It's well known that calcite has what's called birefringence, which means that 
light with different polarizations uh, see a different index of refraction in the crystal. And it, it's very interesting that there's evidence now that, that a mysterious stone called the sunstone from, uh, from uh, Norse uh, writings may actually have existed and that may have been calcite. And so people have found, uh, found a, a calcite crystal associated with a wreck from the 16th century that they think was used to navigate by. So by using the birefringence of the calcite, you can orient the crystal so you know the direction of the sun even when you have a cloudy day. And so it would allow uh, navigators on the ocean during the day to know where the sun is even when they can't see it because it's too cloudy. And so they think that the sunstone actually existed. Okay, the crystal myths. Uh, emeralds are supposed to help foretell the future. Diamonds have broad magical properties that give you strength and bravery. Uh, rubies are ble uh, blessed the, the wearer with health, wealth, wisdom, and success in love. Uh, sapphires protect against poisoning. And I just wanted to finish with one thing I thought was absolutely fantastic. There is a theory based on the fact that there's a difference in the speed with which uh, seismic waves pass through the Earth. That there's, a, there's a, a rather large difference in the speed going one direction versus other directions uh, that has made people think that at the center of the Earth there might be a single gigantic crystal that's uh, thousands of kilometers in uh, diameter. Now that's a crystal. Uh, so one other uh, nice thing you can do, uh, we have actually some kits uh, that will be given to the lucky winners. We have I think 11 kits that we're going to give out to people uh, uh, today uh, that will allow you to grow your own crystals uh, using borax uh, and uh, pipe cleaners. You can actually do, build these kits yourself. It's very simple. You just buy some borax, you uh, dissolve the borax uh, in hot water, try to get the solution uh, as concentrated as you can. You dissolve it and then put the pipe cleaner in and, and the crystals will nucleate on the, on the pipe cleaners and you'll end up with a nice uh, array of crystals uh, that grow out of, out of the solution. And they start to form in about 30 minutes and overnight you'll have uh, your crystals. <clears throat> so again, we want to finish with another song before we tell you about your activities. You guys are on board. We've had many requests, Gene. Yes. Uh -huh. you got to sing a little louder this time. I can see people singing. Let's, let's really... You may know the tune. <laughs> if, if you're Almost perfect single crystal neighbor atoms, atoms in alignment. Life is good here, energy is low. Facets with close packing, flatten out and grow. Take me home, unit cell, to the place where I belong. In alignment with my neighbors, take me home. Face stability alters with condition. Surface changing, atoms come and go. If diffusion limits, then brights often grow. Take me home, unit cell to the place. Why be? Care. Defects beneficial, they oftentimes improve materials, properties, and with much better crystals.
skills we can really change technology technology sing along take me home to unit cell to the place where I belong in alignment with my neighbor Okay, two activities. Uh, one is going to be uh, looking at sand from around the world, different sand, and the other is going to be playing with aligned graphite. Uh, and so you'll be able to see the, uh, the absolutely amazing properties that you can get with this aligned foam graphite. Uh, and then, when you're done with that, we'll have a demonstration of making ice cream with liquid nitrogen. Go back to your original table, and the instructions for this will be very quick.